do uh, just an update on the list. Miss Denise had an updated list, and I appreciate her jumping in and being willing to uh, serve in that capacity. But she, after they got Brother Grant home, which pray for him as he goes through his radiation treatment. He's about done with week two. Um, he's pushing through to week two. Pray for him. But Miss Denise and Brother Howe took him today, and when they got back to the Boyd's house, um, their dog had to be taken, the Boyd's dog had to be taken in in a bad shape, and they don't think the dog has much longer with them. As you can imagine, that could be a hard thing, losing a dog. Um, but Miss Denise and uh, Brother Howell were there uh, staying with Granny and Brother Grant, so pray for them um, as they uh, are helping out there. But uh, are there any additions or subtractions here to be made um, to the prayer list tonight? Yes, ma'am. Melinda Spence. Are you aware of her uh, spiritual condition or anything like that? I didn't guess. Okay. Okay. Pray for Miss Melinda um, with uh, general health issues. You said, would you say gallbladder? Liver transplant, potentially liver transplant. Okay. Pray for Miss Melinda there. Yes, sir, right here. Um, last Monday was uh, the Grand Prix of Holy. Yeah. Donna Paul was told to go to the Lake Ridge Ranch. Right, right. And she had, I think, uh, and I had for text, she said something about her having a little bit of pneumonia. Um, hold on, let me. She does have some pneumonia. She has some gallbladder complications, which they're not willing to address because of her age. Uh, but they, uh, that was uh, late Monday night. But pray for Miss uh, Kay for her health. I believe she's on the list. Yes, she's right there. It's that season of life, you know. You just got to pray for these dear folks. You got to give them grace and endure. Yes, ma'am, I saw your hand. Mm. Brenda Redwine. Did you say Redwine? Okay. All right, we'll pray for Miss Brenda. Any other health uh, or any uh, updates, um, subtractions from the list? We had a good report um, on Kylie's tests. Um, what was that? When? Today's Wednesday, so that was yesterday. yesterday. Good grief, sorry. But some good report there, and do pray that they'll continue to find some answers. Um, help our sweet little Kylie. Um, God would bless her and give her strength. So strong. I, got to, I called her yesterday morning, and uh, she answers her phone. Hello. You know, and it was, oh, man. My, make me think of my little girl, you know. But so strong through it all, and we praise God for that. And uh, just pray for them. Pray that they'd find answers for Kylie. So. Anyone else tonight? All right, well, let's do this. Let's take a few minutes and uh, pray. And uh, here, in, uh, after a while, Brother Richard, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you haven't been called out um, for business, if you wouldn't mind uh, closing out this time in prayer.
Brother Richard, to take your Bibles and turn to Ruth chapter 2, Ruth chapter 3 actually, Ruth chapter 3 and Romans 5, Ruth chapter 3 and Romans 5. I have uh, certainly enjoyed working through the book of Ruth with you and uh, just grateful for what God is teaching me and the lessons to learn about these two wonderful people, Boaz and Ruth, and what a challenge um, it is to us to be what God wants us to be. But if you read the accounts of marriages in the Old Testament, they sometimes read like soap operas. You know, you don't necessarily read that here, but you think about Adam and Eve and the excitement of love for the first time on planet Earth. I mean, this was new love. And yet, very quickly, uh, Adam chose the gift God gave over the giver of the gift. And you had a mess, and you had sin, and you had shame come in pretty quick. You think about Abraham and Sarah, who God had blessed and given promises to, and provision, and just taking care of them physically, giving them great spiritual and physical, tangible promises And yet, multiple times, Abraham got caught in a lie for me, babe, kind of a thing. Or you think about Jacob, Rachel, Leah, and the gang. And how Jacob, he loved one sister and got stuck with another sister. And there seemed to be a never-ending catfight between the two. And along come two other women into his life because of just a royal, royal mess. And even David the king. Now, if you remember, Ruth was likely written... And the era of David the king, right? Because at the end of the book of Ruth, it connects a dot to David. Um, and David's marriage, or should I say his marriage is, okay, his family life were unfortunately not the model for the Israeli family. Not the model at all. And so even you look back at the judges, the setting of the book of Ruth, you don't see much hope for the family. You don't see a lot of hope. For the family at all. And so amidst all of this, Ruth is a refreshing romance. That's really what it is. It is a refreshing romance. This is a love story. And it is love. We see that love is real in a world of division. And that should give us great hope, right? Love is real even in the crazy world we live in. In a world full of division and strife and problems and headaches and back pains and pains in the side, you know, talking about people, that'll be a pain in the side, right? Amidst all that, love is still real. Love is still real. And so Ruth chapters 3 and 4 is where the story reaches its climax. So we're getting there, um, but let's go back to Ruth 2 verse 20, and we're going to read up into verse uh, chapter 3 a little bit. Look at verse 20. It says, And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, this is after Ruth comes back and gives us this glowing report of her day in the field meeting Boaz and everything. And I worked for this guy named Boaz. And Naomi said, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean into the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest. So a significant amount of time has passed from when Ruth first came home to Judah with Naomi. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? She had said something similar back in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is why Naomi wanted them to go back. Okay? She said, The Lord deal kindly with you. Go return to your mother's house. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of your husband. So back before they returned from Moab to Judah, Naomi said, You girls need to go on home because you don't got a fighting chance with me. And I pray the Lord will let you find a man... And you'll have rest, you'll have security, you'll have peace, you'll have comfort, you'll have all the things that a strong man, as a man should be in the life of his family, 
will be for you. That I, I want you to find rest. Well, Ruth says, no, I'm coming with you. I'm concerned about your well-being, Naomi. And so she came back to Judah with her, and she's out working her tail off for them. And here, Naomi's still concerned about her. Naomi realizes, that my time's come and gone. But this young lady, I want her to find rest. And so she says, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred? You need rest, and hey, what about Boaz? Now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. He's down, he's down threshing the wheat, threshing the barley, separating it out. He's down there tonight. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee. You've been in the field all day, girl. You need to clean up. You need to clean up, clean up your elbows, or as Jack would say, your arm pities, and wash up and pretty up. And he, she said, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, and get down there. I'm prettied up, sweetheart, but wait for the right time until he shall have done eating and drinking. A man, after a hard day's work, is going to be in a better attitude after he gets some food in his belly. Okay, Some lessons here. Wait till he have, shall have done eating and drinking, and it shall be when he lieth down. But thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according. I lost my place. And did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. She did it, the humility of Ruth here. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she, Ruth, came softly. And uncovered his feet and laid her down. I'm going to stop there. We're going to keep moving through chapter 3 tonight. But you might be wondering, what is going on here? Right? Two individuals with good character. Two single individuals. And Naomi wanted to match them up. And I've known where this is headed. You kind of pick that up from chapter 2. You know, here's this single poor widow. And here's this single older man. And he's being nice to her. And there doesn't seem to be any anything wrong with the picture. And... And I know I get a sense of where this has been headed, but I didn't think it would go this direction or what it seems to be doing. I mean, a young woman gets all prettied up and she's seeking this older man late at night and covering his feet when he's asleep. What's this? What is this? Now, if you, don't, if you know the story, you know that this is not soap opera material. You know that, okay? But if you don't know the story, you'll see that this was truly a night of true love. This was, in fact, a night of true love. This morning, I tracked down a special file that I brought with me today. This is my file called The Rose of Maryland. The Rose of Maryland. I wasn't allowed to date until my sophomore year of college. I was friendly to everybody, but I didn't really know anything about girls. And I didn't really know anything about dating, for that matter. So I kind of figured it out as I went. You know, fake it till you make it, someone might say. And there were a couple good young ladies that I tried to get to know a little bit, but I, I was notorious, as Elizabeth would say. I became a red flag after a couple of years because I'd get to know a young lady and I'd say, ah, oh, it's not God's will, you know, kind of watch out. He's going to pull the it's not God's will card on you. And, you know, I don't whether I could say dogmatically God told me no for you or God told me no for you. It was probably I didn't feel right about it or maybe I didn't feel like I actually like them. I mean, that's kind of important. You know, you might want to like somebody, you know, that's part of the equation. All right. But enter Liza Jane. Enter Elizabeth. And yes, I called her that since freshman year. I wouldn't have admitted it at the time, but I was probably flirting with her. I called her Liza Jane. And it's funny because it, I think I picked it up from Little House on the Prairie when that jerk bully guy Bartholomew Slade messes with Elizabeth, the teacher, Liza Jane, Liza Jane, you know, and it just Stuck in my head. Whatever. I don't know. Anyways, it's her pet name now. But we worked on uh, the church bus route together. And she wasn't like my rebound or fallback girl. Okay. Um, But she was always around. And if I knew you could be best friends with a girl without dating her, we would have been. And up about sophomore year, we had a mutual interest. But it was, you know, one of those things that didn't feel like this is the right time right now. And so I ghosted her. I mean, there was one time we both got to the same bus, in the big church parking lot, a bunch of buses, same bus, earlier before everyone else, and I sat a couple rows up there, and she sat a couple rows back here, and I even say hi to her. 
She might have said hi when I got on the bus. I just said hi, and I sat down. <laughs> I didn't know anything about girls or nothing, I'll tell you. All right? But by God's grace, even though I heard her, she prayed that he'd bring me back around senior year. And senior year, he did. And I was still a goober. And he was still, or he was still, he was still good. And she was still gorgeous. She was. And I was going to pastor, but she was going to China. And, but the rose of Maryland bloomed in my garden, all right? And so I have an envelope here from this a girl, Elizabeth Rose Barrett, who was totally different than anyone I had ever known or talked to or met. And she just felt like she was the one. I felt she was the one if there was such a thing. And she had my heart beating as fast as Thumper's foot could probably thump. And there was even times, uh, senior year, you've got to have class officers and do stuff for the senior year stuff kind of thing. And I wasn't going to run for any office. And then she ran for uh, the uh, female uh, class rep. And she got it. And then I was like, well, I could run for male class rep. <laughs> and uh, it didn't get it. And uh, I was reading a note in here the other day. And she, had vo- she voted for someone else because I didn't want to be biased, she said. You know, so. But really, we both wanted the same thing. We both wanted to serve Jesus. And I've never had a more exhilarating time of life. I really have, haven't. And you might ask, was that true love? I'd say yes, but just the start. But just the start. You see, as much as I'm thankful for those days, I'm only beginning, beginning to understand what true love is. Really. I mean, when you is twitterpated in college, your mind, your heart, your body, your soul is a lot more focused on another person than when sermons need written and children need trained and finances need balanced and the house needs cleaned and responsibilities come knocking on your door. It's easy to go from two people focused on one thing, us, and feel the rush of that to two people focused on two, three, four, five, six, seven different things. And it's not, that, it's not because the couple despises each other. It's because life requires a lot. And life, if not balanced well, can lead, leave people feeling betrayed by true love. So if true love only means the rush we had then, if true love only means romance that the culture says, if true love then may come up short for life, can we agree that life gets real? Life got real for Naomi, didn't it? And life got real for Ruth. You have Elimelech and his lovely, pleasant wife. And they have these little boys with all the hopes of a future, but their boys are sickly. They make this move. Tragedy strikes. Boom, boom, boom. And loses everything. And she's got a young widow on her hands as she's reeling from the loss of not just a husband, but her children, which we would all agree. Anyone anyone who has children can understand and feel the the gravity or the deep pain that might be accompanied if you had lost your child. And if you have lost a child here, I, 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 I I can't even begin to imagine what that is like. But we can imagine Naomi's deep pain and maybe part of the reason why she wanted to separate from Ruth and, and get away. But we know that life got real for them. And Naomi felt, well, what future do you have with me, Ruth? And, and Ruth, well, she made a life-changing decision, didn't she? Life got real. She lost her man. But evidently she thought, there's nothing for me in Moab anymore. Evidently she looked at her country. She looked at her family. She looked at the circumstances of Moab. And she just decided... This life, these gods, these people aren't for me. Naomi, I know life is hard, but I'd rather go with you. I'd rather commit to you because I love you and I want, to know, I want to commit to your God and I want to commit to your people. And so life got real and Ruth had to get into a new normal after tragedy, after loss, a new normal. See, for, for most of us, who the to tragedy and loss may have not come in our immediate circle and just gripped us to our core and rocked our world and shaken us to the very depths of our soul. We, we it is hard to comprehend when someone else loses someone close, loses someone special. We we can feel it for a moment and be there for a moment and have our arm wrapped around them for a moment and have a casserole for a moment and and all these things, but. Months go by and our life goes on, but they are still reeling in that, feeling that loss. And so you can imagine as Ruth went out to work every day, 
missing her man, wondering about what's ahead, just doing all she could do to to take a next step and, and do something. Can we just agree? Life gets real. But Naomi got hopeful because Ruth comes home that one day at the very beginning of their move. I mean, this is just amazing. You know, we, we can't totally comprehend what it might have been going through Ruth's mind at the time. I mean, Naomi was connecting the dots. Wow, God is good. You know, but we, we can't imagine what Ruth, had, what Ruth was thinking. You know, we, we think about the phrase ourself, hindsight is twenty twenty, and look back and see, whoa, look what God was, that's what God was doing when I didn't land that other job. He was putting me in Cheryl Mads, or it wasn't Maslinkowski, Cologne's life, right? You know, we have no idea what's going on that, that first day Ruth was out in the field, but she but there was hope, and there was this man named Boaz, and a mighty man of wealth, and a man of outstanding character. And it turns out he was related to them. And it turns out he was their kinsman redeemer, Goel. Now, I need to do some groundwork and work quick, but we need this background. Go to Leviticus 25. Hold your place in Ruth. Go to Leviticus 25. I need to hit a couple spots here so we understand a little bit about what the Goel was. The Goel, his role. It's... It's spelled in English G O and then a little accent mark and L, but pronounced Go L like Noel. The kinsman redeemer, the Go L. In Leviticus 25 and verse 23, we read about him. God's expectation for the land, the promised land, right? The land of Canaan. He said, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. Don't sell your land, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor, so you have a brother, and he gets poor for whatever reason, he's had to sell some of his possessions, some of his land, okay? So you're not supposed to sell the land, but he hits hard time, whether it's because he, he had a hardship or because he made a stupid decision or whatever, and he sells the land. If any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return it to his possession. Now, we don't have time to explain this all, but basically, don't sell the land. If, one of your, if a member of your family has to sell something, then there was a family member, the Goel, would buy it back to keep the land in the family. Do you follow that? Okay, look at verse 47. Verse 47. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself. So he's so poor, he's so broke, he doesn't, have, he doesn't really have any land to sell, so he sells himself, kind of as an indentured servant, kind of as a slave in that regard. He sells himself. If he has to do that unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. So the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, wouldn't just buy back land, he'd buy back a man. Keep him in the family. Keep him free. He's the Lord's. He belongs to God. Okay, uh, going up to Numbers 35. Numbers 35. Numbers 35. You can catch up with me. Talking about the avenger of blood, cities of refuge. Cities of refuge were for people that would uh, slay a man by accident. It was, there was no malicious intent. There was no murder. Uh, he was working or whatever, and maybe an axe handle. Uh, the axe uh, head comes off the handle and hits somebody in the head, and they die. The, the person who killed them would have a city of refuge they could run to and be safe. They'd be safe since it was an accident. But for those, in verse 16, that were murderers, and if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die, and he die, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with a hand weapon of wood wherewith he may die, and he die, he's a murderer. And the murderer shall surely be put to death. And you kind of get the idea that if somebody kills somebody, they ought to be killed. Okay? Well, who does the killing? Verse 19. The revenger of blood himself. This is the Goel. The kinsman redeemer was to function as a revenger of blood, shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Okay, so in other words, okay, you, you have this man in the family, the Goel, who would purchase back the land, keep it in the family. You have a man in the family who would purchase back a brother who had to sell himself to, to keep him free. You had a man in the family that, that if someone else killed your brother, you had, that man was responsible to exact the vengeance. 
to buy his life, right, to honor his life, to honor his blood. That was the Goel. Deuteronomy 25, one more mention of this, of the Goel. Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 5. And this is the one that this, I believe this is also called the law of the lever. And this, but it also fits within the responsibilities of the Goel. And this is what applies to Ruth and Naomi, this kinsman redeemer. This is the aspect of the Goel, the kinsman redeemer and his responsibility that applied to their situation. In verse 5, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Okay, her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And so you have two brothers. One gets married, but he dies. His wife goes to the brother. The brother doesn't marry without, so he can raise up seed for his brother's name to keep it in the family, to keep his name alive. Are you following, seeing the trend? The land mattered. The name mattered. The life mattered. The, the, the future of the family, the future of the land, it mattered. And so the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, played an important part of that. And he would perform the duty of a husband and brother unto her. Verse 6, And it shall be that the firstborn which he beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. So this brother dies, she remarries this brother. Their first child would be named after Elimelech. Are you following? Okay. Or Malon. Okay. Verse 7, or end of verse 6. They would do that, and this is why. That his name be not put out of Israel. Every man, every man's name mattered in that nation. Every man was important. Verse 7. If the man liked not to take his brother's wife. Ah, <laughs> she's been my sister-in-law long enough, and I'd rather, you know. Then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. This wasn't about the wife. It was about the brother. And if a brother wasn't willing to function as the Goel, to function as the kinsman redeemer, the, it wasn't about the wife. It was about he was dishonoring the name of his brother. And she would go to the elders at the gate. And he doesn't want to honor the name of his brother. He won't perform the duty of my husband's brother. The elders of his city would call him and say, speak unto him. And if he says, yeah, I'd like not to take her. I'd rather not have her. Um, that's right. Then his brother's wife will come into the presence of the elders and she would take his shoe off his foot, Right? He'd be walking around with one shoe. She'd take his shoe off his foot and she'd spit in his face. She'd spit in his face and answer him, This is what it should be done to the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel. This is how he would be known in Israel. The house, okay, I've got to get this right. The house of him that hath his shoe loosed. So you have a man who doesn't want to raise up seed unto his brother, he doesn't want to function, even if he, is, he has the right, the responsibility as in your kinsman to be the goel and redeem this and raise up a name for his brother, he doesn't have to do that. God doesn't make you do anything. But that doesn't mean you can get away without consequences. If he wasn't willing to do that, he'd be dishonored the rest of his life. That's how important this was to God. This was how important it was. The Goel truly had to be a selfless and important role. The land, the life of Israel families was important to the Lord. But at this point, Elimelech's family and their future, was it bright? No. Life got real. Naomi was getting hopeful. Let me ask you something, okay? Who was it important? To who was it important for people like this, for their lives and their land to be redeemed? Who made these laws? God did. Who brought Naomi and Ruth back to Judah? God did. Who made Ruth hap upon Boaz's field? God did. So you're connecting the dots, and Naomi was connecting the dots too. And so Naomi sent Ruth to appeal to the law of Goel. Her eyes were starting to get off of herself. That's a good thing. That is a really good thing. And Naomi and Ruth weren't flying blind about Boaz. They had gotten to know him. Gotten to know him for several months here. And so Naomi, that's when Naomi sent. And let's check this out. We've got to work through this quick. Verse 7. Naomi, or Boaz, he lays down. His heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And Ruth sneaks in there, uncovers his feet, and laid down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. I think if I woke up and there was a woman that I didn't know at my feet, I'd probably be afraid. And he turned himself. 
And behold, a woman lay at his feet. Oh, what are you doing? He said, he said who art thou? And she, she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. You see, the place of a servant was at somebody's feet. Are you picking up on this? The place of a servant. She was at his feet. She was a servant. And she said, I am your handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid. In other words, redeem me to ask for someone to spread their skirt over you or for a woman to ask a man to spread his skirt. It wasn't a skirt like we would know it. I mean, it's getting kind of weird, okay? All right? Uh, But you understand it. I mean, he was wearing, I don't know, what was it, a tunic? Let's just say it was a tunic, all right? Spread your tunic over me. It was basically, for a widow to say that to a man was basically saying, redeem me. Bring me under your protection. In other places, this word skirt is translated like the wings, like the wings of the Lord under whom thou hast come to trust. Bring me into your protection. In other words, fulfill the role of Goel. Be my kinsman, redeemer. And Ruth wasn't coming to him. She wasn't coming to him and saying, I have my rights to this. She was coming in humility. She was coming in as a servant. She was coming humbly, and Boaz was blown away. He said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. You've been kinder to me on the back side of this than you were on the front side. You were real sweet at the beginning, but now you're super kind. And why? Because you see that uh, he says, Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich, you didn't run after the young men. Wait, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If she wasn't chasing after the young men, then what was Boaz? He wasn't some spring chicken. He was an older man. And he says, Now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requires. I'm going to do that. Now, this is why he was going to do. This is why. Watch this. This is why he was going to fulfill this selfless obligation. This is why he was willing. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. It had everything to do with Ruth's character. This stranger, this poor widow... He was willing to do this because of her character. But then he says, but hold on a second. (laughs) Got some bad news, honey. You ever get your hopes up and then, you know, someone like takes a little pin out of their hair and pops your balloon? He says, it's true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. You can just feel the wind coming out of Ruth's sails. (gasps) You know. Terry, this night, though, he says, just stay here. And in the morning, if... If he will do that, if he'll be the kinsman, then great, but let him do it. But if he won't, then I will. As the Lord liveth, he said, okay, here we go. He's swearing by the name of the Lord here. He's promising to her, I will do this, so why don't you lie down until the morning? And so she lay at his feet until the morning. If she had gone back up in the middle of the night, listen, this is the time of Judges. The middle of the night was when that one girl at the end of Judges was abused by sodomites all night long and then left dead at the front porch. If you were a woman, if you were a man, you didn't want to be out at night. Boaz was protecting her. He was taking care of her. He said, stay here. And she rose up before one could know know another. She got up super early in the morning. He said, don't let it be known that a woman came into the floor. He was protecting her character. He was protecting her honor. He cared about her. And he said, hey, bring the veil that you have with thee and hold it. And she held it out. He measured six measures of barley and gave it to her. And she went back to the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, her mother, it's probably still early in the morning. Her mother-in-law can't see her. Who's this person? And who art thou? Who art thou, my daughter? What's the report? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she showed her the barley. These six measures of barley gave him me. For he said to me, go not empty into thy mother-in-law. Then she said, sit still. Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Now I want you to notice a few things and I've got to wrap up here. Notice Ruth, first of all. Are, Are you picking up that for Ruth, this wasn't about Ruth? A long time ago, She could have stayed where she was and found some young, flashy guy, right? Found a future, whatever. Gone with the trends of the day of her youth and just done that. She could have done that here. There were lots of young people around over here, but the whole way she was humbly listening. She was humbly serving. She was humbly looking out for who's good, Naomi's. Listening to Naomi. For Ruth, this wasn't about Ruth. But also for Boaz, who thinks this wasn't about Boaz? 
It wasn't about Boaz. Boaz willingly accepted the proposal based on her character, not her looks. If Boaz was a man of ill repute, of ill character, a long time ago, he could have had her. But that wasn't who he was. But two, he acknowledged someone else's right. He protected her. He provided her. He was practically already acting like the kinsman redeemer. For Boaz, this wasn't about Boaz. Listen, this was a night of true love. Lust was 10,000 miles away from what was going on this night. It doesn't mean they were inhuman. It just means they were committed to God and others first. But here's the problem. We're left hanging in suspense. What's going to happen? If, if you really want to know, well, you probably already do know, you go and read it. But would you agree with me that everyone was starting to think, thank God Ruth came home with Naomi. Thank God. In a time when every man did what was right in his own eyes, when good character was uncommon, when lust and selfishness was the norm, here were two people starting to really hope true love is worth it. And this is what true love was. First, it was commitment to Jehovah God. Ruth, way back in Moab, Boaz, it was business as usual, obeying the law of God, being uh, selfless. And second, they were committed by the care, or they were committed to care for his people. This was true love on display. Now think about this, think about this. The Israelite reading this in David's day, if they're really paying attention, if they really care to know what God said about the past, they would start to think that this love God, love others thing actually works. Because if you, if you read the times of David, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, you have the ups and downs of the kingdom of Israel where people struggle to do two things, love God and love others. But here in Ruth, you have a reminder that loving God and loving others actually works. And this is how Israel was meant to be. The future of their nation was dependent on the families and the land. And if true love happened like this, their future would. Now, we know Israel tanked. Matthew's gospel tells us that. Israel needed a savior from their sin. They needed a new heart to love God and others. But listen, folks, we don't have to tank. We don't have to go down. We have Jesus. We have the Holy Ghost. Let's wrap up in Romans 5 and we'll be done. Romans 5. Catch up with me. Romans 5, if your fingers there, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice and hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. When life gets real, it's not a bad thing, because tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, if you hope for something like Naomi did, the balloon's not going to pop. Why is that? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So no matter how life gets real, all things, because of the love of God and our hearts by the Holy Ghost, because of our Redeemer, who bought us back, because of Him, all things work together for good to them who that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that what loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, when life gets real, true love makes life worth living. And perhaps, like Ruth and Naomi, you've been living life in suspense. What's going to happen next? Perhaps God has given you some hope. Perhaps life got real a year ago. But God has begun to give you some hope, but you're at a point of time when you're hanging in suspense, when you don't know, maybe even in your marriage, maybe in your family life, 
Maybe in your church life, maybe in your country life, and you're hanging by a thread, and you're hanging by suspense, and life used to be exciting, it used to be a rush, it used to be full of adrenaline of what true love was then. But the reality is the same love that you experienced when you first believed the gospel is the same love in your life this very moment, this very day. And it is the true love that even tomorrow when you get up and you don't want to get up and you don't want to have this conversation with that person again and you don't want to have to walk down memory lane down that way again. True love in your life because of Jesus and because of the Holy Ghost, it makes life worth it. So just keep living it. Keep living it and hoping for chapter 4. Because there is true love for you. Let's pray together and be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for your sweet people and their attention to it. I pray you bless them. Help us all rest in your love. Help us live it. God, help us practice it. I pray that the love of God would be the bedrock of our lives. God, you are perfect love. And I pray we know you and that people would know your love through us no matter the circumstances. Help each person here tonight live that way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, we love you. You have a good week.